All right. The reason, and that is not by chance. You clearly have more people living on Earth. You can see on the y-axis here. And the human ecological footprint causes spillover of the microbes from a wildlife to people. You could also think about nature, you know, keeping a check on us. <laughs> but that's the way it is. So we might expect more pandemics to come. Very good. Now, this is the status now. All the data that uh, me and my colleagues have been using, they're publicly available by the world, uh, on the World Health Organization website, the World Meters, and John Hopkins. This is the current status, up to, uh, during to August 25th. There are about uh, under 80,000 new cases per day, confirmed about uh, 23 and a half millions. And as I said before, about 800,000 deaths. We have a lot of data. With respect to the past, we have much more data that we haven't dreamed of. So we can try to rationalize this data. That's what theoretical physicists do, try to recognize patterns from data. So we'll introduce you something we've been working on, which is the epidemic remuneration group. You will see how we can use that to define what we can consider the human cost of waiting. So when you wait to close the borders, you wait to impose social distancing, how long should you wait? Or how, much you should how fast should implement those to reduce the pandemics? That's our answer where we can, these are questions where we can try to give an answer. Of course, we don't have a crystal sphere, <laughs> but we can try to understand that. And then use that as a playbook for future waves. Of course, whatever we do for this pandemic can be used for any other pandemic. Huh? As I said, we have, you have a smartphone with you, right? So Google and Apple, actually, they can track your location. This can be used in many ways, but there are also good ways of using it. So we will see how to use Google and Apple data to actually uh, quantify the, um, the amount of social distancing. Because of course, it's always nice to uh, say, we have been very good in Denmark. Let's see. In terms of mobility or immobility compared to other countries, how good we were in staying at home. And then I will actually say what are the possible next steps. I don't want to burden you with a very heavy talk, so I'll try to keep it as light as possible. Okay? Now, back to uh, the epidemiological immunization group. These are the amazing colleagues I had the privilege, and I have the privilege to work with. And we work from string theory now to pandemics. I never thought in my lifetime to actually apply what we do to pandemics, but it happened. Uh, we started with Michele, which is a professor here, and then uh, Domenico Orlando from the University of Bern in Torino joined. And now Giacomo and his student, Corentin, uh, from the University of Lyon. As I said already, it's been a privilege for me, and it is a privilege to work with amazing researchers. I always learn so much. How did it all start? We'll say in a second. But whatever I'm going to say is based on these five papers. The second one was accepted a couple of days ago in Nature. And it's about establishing, indeed, the randomization group approach for pandemics. It all started with asking uh, this question, when can we travel again? So in uh, at the beginning of February, we received an email from our insulin leader saying that you have to postpone your traveling. So I was supposed, I was scheduled to give a talk at MIT, and it's a couple of weeks a year in the spring. I had no idea when I could actually go back there and what that meant to actually postpone. <laughs> Nobody gave us any information about that. So discussing with Michele, we said, well, let's check the situation in Italy. Maybe that gives us a clue for when we can travel again. I don't know. There are many examples of curiosity-driven research, but this is curiosity-driven research. 
<laughs> so this is actually the way I think about curiosity driven research. And we started, and we realized pretty soon we were not gonna travel for a while. Good. So we started uh, developing this uh, approach, which then, uh, which we borrowed from uh, particle physics, but is applied in other fields too. Huh? So this is actually uh, a way to uh, understand the system, complicated system in a simpler manner. So I don't pretend that you can follow everything I'm gonna say, but I'm go in one slide I'm gonna give you the definition or the understanding of the the recommendation group and what it's good for. Now imagine that you have a physical system, like this could be a bunch of atoms, could be a lot of people. They interact across each, with each other with a certain interaction strength. Typically these are very complex systems, right? You don't want to really deal with each single individual with each single uh, no, atom. But you can zoom out rewrite your system with fewer atoms, fewer people, but modified interaction strength. So you renormalize the strength. And eventually, if you can do, you can go to very, very simple, uh, effective description of your system with fewer degrees of freedom, but modified interaction strength. If you're smart in doing that, you're actually gaining a lot because now you have a much simpler uh, way to deal with your system. That is the romanization group in a nutshell. And it's been extremely powerful in physics to understand fundamental interactions. So in words, it allows you to study physical systems at different scales. A change of scale is, you know, a scale transformation. And therefore, if you arrive to a point where after a transformation, the system doesn't transform anymore, then you arrive at a point where there is scale invariance. In such, it doesn't change anymore. If you want to explain to a kid how this works, you can think about the change of scale. In this case, for the pandemics, is the time scale. It's a changing of the magnifying power of your microscope. Of course, I'm assuming that you can do that smoothly. There might be cases where I cannot zoom out all the time. Is it clear? This is, in a nutshell, the renormalization group. It will require a certain degree of mathematics to, to explain it, in detail, but this is actually the idea. Now, how do we apply to pandemics? Okay, so look at the way, for example, in Italy, you have the number of total number of infected uh, number of weeks. Huh? You see that at the short times, you have zero infected. That is clearly a, scale a time invariant statement, right? Zero today, zero tomorrow, zero all the time. <laughs> that is, you can change the time, it's still zero. Then you arrive at a point where you almost get to a plateau of infected people. So if, if you really reach a plateau, you also have time in variants up here. So I could actually imagine to construct an effective description of this curve in terms of something that knows about invariance at the beginning and at the end. So I'm actually giving you a solution for how this looks like. Solutions are very powerful. So it's we find out with Michele that it was more convenient rather than using the total number of infected people, the log of it. It's just that it's more smoothly, uh, it's, it's, it's a slowly varying function than just IoT, but it doesn't really matter, you can use IoT itself. And these are the two places where you can start imagining to uh, apply this principle. Now, for the few, you uh, know, uh, people that actually love equations also to show that we're actually serious about that. Let me tell you how this works in practice. So I define some uh, primitive function called beta, historically, which is basically nothing but the, the variation of the uh, alpha, which is the log of infected, 
and I say it's proportional to this function. At alpha itself times one minus alpha over a. Now you immediately see that there are two zeros here, alpha equal to zero, which is at the very beginning of the time, and alpha equal to a, which is at the very end of the time. Having two zeros tells you that at the end and at the beginning of the epidemic, there is, killing, there is time dilation invariance. That's what actually gives you uh, for free this property. If you now invert this simple first order differential equation, you get a solution, an analytic solution. And you could argue, which so, you know, would actually really work, which of course is very simple. Now there are two param three parameters here, A, gamma, and B. B is just an integration constant. And it's technically a shift. When, does, when did the epidemic start in Italy? Beginning of February, beginning of March, and so forth, so on. That B actually takes an account of that. It's not something the model predicts. It's something that you actually have to fit. Now, can we do a good job to, that, to, to understand that curve with only effectively two parameters, which are A and gamma? And what do they represent? So let me just, uh, even before doing the fit, tell you what actually these parameters do. Right, gamma controls the interaction rate, and therefore what you heard on, on television, the flattening of the curve. The bigger is gamma, you still reach in the end the same number of infected people, but only you reach at different times. So the larger is gamma, and gamma is in, measured in inverse weeks. So gamma equal to one means it takes about one week to get to the, to the peak. So this is a derivative of uh, this, which is the number of new infected, okay? So this is, this is where this peaks is actually at this point here, where there's an inflection point here. And you immediately see gamma equal to one and gamma equal to five is what you've seen from the, uh, on TV when they were discussing this uh, flattening of the curve. That what does the flattening of the curve. The area beneath these two curves remains the same. So you still get the same number of infected people, you just postpone them. Of course, if you are in the health system, that helps because you are not gonna have so many hospitalized people on one given day. It just actually reduce the number of hospitalized people. Make sense? So the flattening of the curve is still in, uh, uh, it really helps the health system, for example, not to go to a hold. E to the A is the total height, which is the integral underneath these curves, and is the total number of infected people in the end of the, of the epidemic. B is just a temporal shift, so you just can easily fit it to a specific. Now the question is, there are only two parameters. You know, I know we have many, many data, so how well do they do? All right. So if the time structure is very rep well reproduced, then I should be able to do a good job. Now, of course, the definition of good job is you know, maybe in the eyes of the builder, but if you look at the gross structure of the epidemic, indeed you see that this was for Italy, that with a 90% confidence level, and if you for a moment forget the linear growth here, which we are not forgetting, but you know, for just a, a start, you see that the, we reproduce the, this data pretty well, and very effectively all the point of the remediation group. Do it very effectively. We are not looking at the subtle structure of what happened yesterday and tomorrow morning and uh, three days ago, but the overall structure over many weeks. And also this number gamma, you will find that for all the countries, actually it's a number between roughly 0 0.2 and, and 0 0.8, okay? So we could then predict in March when you're very close to the, uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the peak, you can predict with a week or two actually where the peak more or less is gonna be. That's why we were not lucky but when we end up on the, on the new. Because it's not a crystal sphere, so we always to take it to within the confidence error and so forth so on, but it gives us a good description of that. Now imagine that you can do this for all the countries, which means now only two parameters per each country is enough for a single wave. That's a very helpful 
we can say, I can classify countries by two numbers. You have heard also on TV that, you know, the other models that also try to do that. And of course, they're related. Once you try to explain the same data, the models are related. Right. Probably one which is uh, uh, kind of uh, time honored is uh, the SIR model. This SIR model is a beautiful model because it's very intuitive. And SIR stands for susceptible infected recovery. Now the SIR model has many, many variations, many, many different types. But it's basically the mother of all the compartmental model. Compartmental means that you really take the population, you divide in subpopulations. Okay, there's nothing fancy about that. And uh, they enjoy a conservation law. That the number of uh, susceptible plus the number of infected plus the number of recovered must be a constant, the overall number of the population. In this, you can, people has done all kinds of variations on this thing. Uh, and there's a set of first order differential equations where you see that the susceptible in this case uh, decrease when the number of infected increases. At the same time, so the number of infected increases uh, with the same rate. Gamma is not the same gamma we had before. It's another constant in this SIR model. Uh, and there's another term here that uh, is related to the fact you're losing the number of infected once they recover. So the number of recovered is proportional to the number of infected. That is the simplest uh, model used since 1927. And it was uh, written down by Kermack and McKendrick in the Royal uh, Society uh, paper. Good. And ever since I've actually been using that, you can show many, very beautiful things of that. The original model with this constant, gamma tilde and epsilon, as constant doesn't really work because this infection rate and epsilon are actually time dependent. So people have constructed variations on that. Uh, if you want to map it into hours, we are given, given you actually an explicit construction with Michele. And what we had before as our total number in the ERG is the number of infected plus the number of recovered. You can extract them if you want to, but it will cost you complicating the model a little bit. And uh, our model corresponds to a specific type of uh, SIR model where this gamma itself is a time-dependent function, which is a good thing because it is a time-dependent function in reality. Good. Now, what are the advantages of the ERG? The first thing is that I provide you an analytic expression. I solve the differential equation. I give you actually an analytic expression. So that actually saves you time when you want to do fits, for example, because you just directly fit to the function. Uh, it is sy symmetry based, right? I told you that I'm using properties of at the beginning and at the end of the epidemic. And I encode the symmetry in my approach. So as you know, when you encode symmetries in your approach, that simplifies your problem. That's what physicists have been doing since the dawn of physics, using symmetry to simplify problems. Uh, if, for example, if you want to study something which has a spherical symmetry, you don't want to use Cartesian coordinates. You want to use spherical symmetry. But if you want to map Earth and you start to with the Cartesian coordinates, that's not a smarter thing to do. You want to use the symmetry of the sphere. If you want study this bottle of water, you want to use cylindrical symmetry because it's invariant under rotation. If you don't do that, your equations are much more complicated and you're losing. Uh, you're going to get the same result again if you do the computation right, but only at the cost of a very long computation. For uh, at least the simplest uh, naive ERG, Two parameters are enough, more or less, to classify each country. And the time structures are well described. On the right hand side, just to kind of uh, show you, we have done this for all the countries in the world. So here we're comparing, and these are normalized per million inhabitants. Okay, this is Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Switzerland. You see actually that within a few weeks, they all reached the peak. It means that to a certain extent, they were all using similar social distancing. 
At the same time, some had a higher peaks. Now, this can be compared because we're normalizing per million, right? So for example, the one that uh, picked more was, uh, if I can read it carefully, uh, correctly, is uh, Switzerland. It didn't do much. And this is the number of new infected. And uh, as we also dis discussed in our first paper with Michele and Domenico, once you do the feed to the data, the closer you get to the peak, the better you can actually extract your gamma and A and predict what happens afterwards. Provided you don't change the rules of the game as we go along, right? If by any chance we do this game and let's say one, say country X decides to change the social rules, then of course that doesn't make sense. Right? You cannot change the rules of the game as you play. That, that's cheating. And I don't allow you to cheat. Now, once this was actually uh, in place, we could actually go uh, global and uh, study what we can summarize as a human cost of waiting. So how much does it cost you not enforcing social distancing in terms of human life? It's something you like to know, especially in days like this. You will see there'll be actually nice surprises, maybe not that nice, but you will actually see what's going on now. The other thing also we notice that Please don't concentrate on a single country. You, everything you hear on TV is about Denmark, to the largest extent. Everything you hear in Italy is about Italy. But what can you learn from a single country? Very little. Right. It can be an accident, it can be a fluke, it can be a miscounting. It's only when you compare many, 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 many countries, you have an overall picture that actually makes sense. And the way they interact with each other. That's when you want a very powerful method that allows you to do that with your laptop rather than supercomputers. Because I'm very wary when you have hear that people are working on this stuff, they have supercomputers and have thousands of parameters inside that. Any variation of those parameters leads to immense uh, stochastic effects, which are very hard to uh, take into account or consideration. Very good. So this paper with Giacomo. It's a couple of days ago, uh, last week, being accepted in Nature. And it's basically the foundation, how do we take what we've done with Michele and Domenico and now take into consideration interaction across different countries. What I gave you was a solution for a single country in isolation. So you set the rules, you have social distancing, whatever rules you want, and then you have the pandemic spread out there. Epidemic spread out there. Now I really want to study pandemic, which means global. How did Italy affect Denmark? Hmm? Because we hear these things. We hear this case here, this case there. But I mean, how do these things really work in practice? Good. So to do that, let me just generalize the energy to take into account interactions. Now, I'm considering different regions of the world. Huh? Each different region is identified with a label I. And now you have, for each region, the same uh, as if it were in isolation. Now allow interaction terms. These are actually easy to understand. KIJ is a matrix that takes into account travelers. Normalize all per million. So this NMI is the number of millions uh, uh, of country I. And this is just the difference in the number of uh, infected in the two cases, in the two countries. But this is for, you can do it for the entire world. Because this is a, a series of differential equations where i goes between one, and you decide how many countries you want to keep it inside, inside, the, inside the, uh, uh, your equations. Kij is proportional to the number of weekly travelers from region i to region j, and vice versa, in millions. We kind of checked, and it's basically of the order of 10 to minus 3. 5 times minus 3, I mean, basically 1,000 of travelers between different regions. Okay, so you can tune that, because it could also be that you have super spreaders young people that go to a disco in uh, Northern Italy, then come back and then go to 10 disco in uh, Copenhagen. They count for many more travelers than just an average traveler of my age that goes home in the evening, right? So that's where you have, say K is, K Kappa is kind of proportional to the number of travelers. 
How does this work? Okay, so now we can study on the right hand side. Let's have two regions. You can, you're free to think about region one as Italy, and region two be Denmark. And region one is already infected. And now you have exchange between these two countries. And I want to study the effect of border control versus social distancing. Gamma, or the infection rate, is actually a measure of social distancing. As you remember, the smaller is gamma, the more you flatten the curve. Right? So let's see what happens. So I'm counting here. This, this, this is weeks from when I close the frontiers. Okay? And this is the, uh, where region one, say Italy has got the peak. Now, rule of thumb, if you wait to do anything, by the time the region one has got to the peak, keep it open. Forget about social distancing. You're already infected. There's no way, there's no reason to get the economy to get a hit. <laughs> because if you wait that much, that's it. But you can ask what happened if you close the frontiers before the peak. So if you close the frontiers, let's say, almost immediately, then you can delay, this is a de when region two gets the peak. So you can delay the peak as you close earlier, earlier, earlier and earlier. Of course, you never really close at the beginning. So you always have basically around here. But you find, what we find out is that for different gammas here, that gamma at two equal to 0 0.4, this is where you get the strongest um, delay in reaching the peak in region two. So what you can uh, find, what we find is that uh, social distancing is more effective than border control when you actually want to delay the peak. And this is you can find from these studies. Been able to follow? It's not very complicated. I mean, many of the things turn out also to be actually a mathematical uh, expression of common sense, but still, it's, you know, common sense is not what we always use when we see data. <laughs> Putting in equations helps. All right. Now, of you have watched um, Game of Thrones. There was a paper which, from which I saw part of the of this title called Winter is Coming for the Second Wave. We had a paper roughly at the same time, but uh, we did not use Winter is Coming because effectively it's already come, as you see. It's coming summer rather than winter. <laughs> so then we actually applied this method to, for example, investigate what happens in Europe, how the epidemic, pandemic playbook works for, for the Europe. And how this works. Okay. So imagine that you're France as a country. So our model, uh, we have uh, allowed for interaction of each European country with each European country, plus an extra region X, because we can control, and then, for example, that Croatia let people from Russia in. So, so we actually have an extra country, region X, that means the rest of the world. That's why we get, you know, again, restarted the pandemics, because as this subsides in Europe, then eventually somewhere else is, is growing, and we are in contact with this. There's no system which is completely isolated. It could be also hotspots. Slaterin, for example, where they have so many people dying, or infected, it could be also a hotspot, it can be seen as region X. So whatever we cannot control is region X. So we allow for travel across countries with reasonable uh, values of unit exchange. Uh, region X is the world hotspots. We are assuming a herd immunity. And to the best of our knowledge, that is not yet proven that there is herd immunity. And in fact, we know from a, a case last week that after three, four weeks, a, a person in Korea affected by COVID the first time has been uh, infected again. We don't know to which extent that leads to, uh, nobody knows which is done at least to a certain degree of immunity. But, so that's what we've done so far. 
and we allow to up to 10 variations so we, uh, of the gamma of the first wave. So I was, in, I was interviewed by a saying, but Francesco, how do you know there's going to be a second wave? So I was responding that to him, Croatia is already the second wave. And so I asked him, what, are you make, what makes you think that Denmark is special? And have you ever seen Denmark not getting a flu again? So he was convinced that um, we can also get it. And you will see we have already started. So the second wave started, and we can be even more uh, uh, precise about that. As of August 5th, 2020, these are all the countries where the second wave has already started in Europe. I understand why we want to be in denial. We, want, we like the life like we have now. We don't want to be locked down. But one thing is actually enjoying a good life. One thing is being in denial. So this is happening. And this August 25th, I will tell you what is August 25th. Uh, so many of our uh, fellow citizens were on vacation in these places. Spain, Greece, Croatia. I mean, who doesn't enjoy good weather somewhere else? I was in Henestran at the beginning of the vacation. It rained for an entire week. So I would have loved to be in Italy or in Spain too. So, good. Now, so based on that, we made a prediction on August 5th and how uh, Italy, France, and UK, for example, would actually. Uh, Play out. And I try to be, we try to be very conservative. So we put a 10 to the minus 4, this traveling number between different countries, hoping for a certain degree of, uh, of social distancing still enacted. enacted. Um, so this is the situation now. So this was in August 5th on the left hand side, what we made as a prediction with 10% variation in gamma. And you assuming this kappa of Denmark with the uh, average gamma, uh, average interaction across different countries to be of the order 10 to minus 4. Can you see the second wave here in Denmark? Yeah. So it's happening. Now, if you allow for this interaction matrix to have an average around 10 to minus 3, which is a reasonable about 1,000 travelers <laughs> from different countries. Uh, they go to Denmark and vice versa. Then you get this spot on completely. That's the way you tune a little bit this uh, this uh, model. It takes it, it's a very powerful model because it allows us to do that not only for Denmark actually, right? Uh, so the but this this change here of an order of magnitude in K actually is, is uh, translates the epidemic back by four weeks. So it's happening now. The, uh, these are the other countries, some of the other countries. It makes no sense for me to actually uh, show you all the countries. That's happening in Europe right now. As you can see, uh, Croatia has gone to the third wave. Um, we don't know yet the impact in terms of number of deaths as a first on, but uh, I just remind you that in many southern countries, the school have not started yet. The university will be in full power in, uh, you know, next week. So what do you think is going to do to this? Make it better or worse? I appeal you to common sense. You can be in denial if you want to, but that's the way it's going to be. Right. Of course, there are also better way of testing now. So. Maybe more new cases have been because we have a better testing facility. So that will probably allow the ratio between infected to uh, people dying to decrease, sure, with respect to the number of infected. But nevertheless, we are in full power in the second wave. So we might expect even a third wave soon. <laughs> right? Because the vaccine does not, we don't know exactly what kind of vaccine we're going to get, whether it's going to. Uh, work on the long term and the short term. Just read an article yesterday, and actually, we there is no consensus of what it's going to do. I also want you to realize that 
It might not affect too many people, but for people with certain conditions, so this is a death penalty. So be considerate. I hear kind of uh, interesting uh, discussions, but you have to be considerate. Respectful of people with conditions. Those are the ones that will be affected by that. So this is not to scare, this is actually to uh, allow governments to prepare themselves. You can, do, you can do prevention with that. That's what you should do with this analysis. These analyses are open to everybody. Everybody can come, take our laptop, take our Mathematica file, and we will give it to whomever wants to use it, including government, if they're really interested in being prepared. All right. So this is the movie that we had, uh, we put outside. It's still the one uh, adjourned to uh, August 5th. But it is a slow one. I'm sorry, fast, if there is a more delay than we see now, but just to show how we are actually for the prediction how can you be prepared for the new waves to come uh, you can of course also complicate the model eh? so there's another the problem stuff the other thing I was interested in is that I hear many ministers saying you know we did a good job we had a very good social distancing but I mean being a scientist without a measure I don't know what it means do you So can actually we measure social distance? The impact of it. Because I don't understand it without an analysis. Maybe Denmark is special respect to Italy, but I want to understand why. Right. <laughs> so we can actually use both Google and Apple. And they, they did a great job. So they actually Google released the movement trends by region of the world uh, normalized to a certain time before the pandemic. We can discuss whether it was a good normalization or not a good normalization, but it is a normalization. And they have different category of places. One of that is residential, and the other one is working. It means how many more people stayed at home and how many more people did not go to work? Their data, we can mine them. They're open to everybody. You can do that too. So there is no absolute uh, privilege here. Apple did something else. And it's good to consider different approaches. Apple said, oh, OK, Eva is using the iPhone. Or the, and uh, she's actually looking on the, uh, on the maps where she wants to go. So they actually um, check whether or not you intend to leave a home and go somewhere else. Go to work, or you're going to a park. You will see that the dance went all to parks. Or you like to travel more or less. And they check whether you were doing for driving or for walking. Now, if I take two completely independent, unbiased set of, uh, or you know, they could be even biased set of data, I should get the same result. Otherwise, I won't be able to consider that a good uh, result. So what, what does it mean result here? So what we did, what I call it the immobility competition. So on the left, on, on the axis here, I, here are only Google data, but we also cross check them. It's just that for the talk makes no sense to show all the plots. So imagine that uh, after, uh, oh, after each country has uh, gone, has uh, lowered the, the, by 20% the number of people going to work, for example. Uh, we can check how many more people were at home as a function of the workplace. 
So minus here means minus 30% went to work, minus 40% went to work, minus 50% work, and so forth. So now this, uh, to guide your eyes, there are several countries in red. And these are the ones which clearly stayed more at home, more residential, and went less to work. So let's call them high immobility uh, countries. And you know there's one at the very end, Sweden, right? <laughs> because they did not, they kept going to work, right? And they kept moving. But all the others are in between. Now, uh, this uh, tadpole, it shows that we've done the average of the beginning of lockdown over a few weeks to make sure that uh, the things were also consistent across weeks. Okay. But it was interesting for us to see that Denmark, can you see it is around here? They were not staying at home very much. The Danes were not staying at home. In fact, if you look in the other category of places, what goes up are parks. The Danes were all the parks. The Italians, the Spaniards, and uh, they were staying at home. They were not leaving home. They were not allowed to leave home. So that actually is consistent. Uh, it's consistent both for Apple and for Google, two completely different set of data, right? So again, Apple, as people were walking less in Italy, and they were driving less. Sweden, they were not walking less, or not by much, and they were not driving less. Make sense? So in the immobility competitions, the red countries won, or you can actually say this, you can turn it around in the mobility competition, Sweden won. <laughs> if you don't like to lose, you can always turn it around. Uh, and of course, that's not an obvious impact in terms of, uh, you know. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I'm sure they will come. <laughs> I'm sure it's already come. Yeah, I'm sure it's already come. Does that make sense? I was refreshing for me to do things I never done in my life. So, uh, all right. But the other thing that we were interested in: what is the impact on social distancing? So, what we could do is imagine that this is uh, the uh, infection rate, infection curve as a function of time. We are showing the log of it. And can you differentiate in this curve? I told you before there were two numbers: the total number of infected and infection and the overall infection rate, which already did a good job. But can I do even a better job? Meaning, can I differentiate the three regions on this curve, at least roughly three regions, where I can identify a region of pre-measures, a region where I have one uh, infection rate, and another one have a, a new one. And that's that the new one go up or, or goes down for each country. Because then I, I will tell you in a second, I can define a measure for the impact of social distancing. This is relative for each country, so there is, no comp there is no way that Italy will win over Denmark or so for so on. But for each country, it could also be just psychological. People stay more at home, touch less other people. So that's also social distancing. Right? In Italy, you kiss on the cheeks twice. In France, you kiss, th you you kiss three times. So also known as the kiss of death. Right. So. This was a simulation for us, and this is actually the result. So how long does it take to go from, uh, so first of all, we could identify two different gammas, two different action rates, roughly, and how long did it take for these measures to, to kind of uh, have an impact? In average, you can see that around four to six weeks before you see a change in the curve. Now, this is a very tiny change, but actually visible. So this, oh, sorry. So this is actually how many countries were actually uh, after four weeks. Right? There are some outliers, but effectively the distribution tells you that most of the countries were between two and six weeks where they had this change in behavior. I shouldn't really call social distancing effect, but change in behavior. So you can measure it in percent now. And the next slide is indeed quantified. So now that we identify that, that's actually providing percent, the change in the infection rate. And you see how pretty much they're close to each other, right? 
there is a, a peak between minus 40 and minus 20 percent. So there is a decrease in the infection rate. That's exactly what you were expecting. The more social distancing you have, the more the curve afterwards will flatten out. By how much? About 40 to 20 percent. So social distancing, in a most general sense, yields a reduction of 25 to 45 percent for infection rate. We did for Europe, but I can already tell you we have done already for US. The difference is in the United States comes out the same result. This will come later. It takes about two to five weeks after the onset of mobility reduction. So you have to wait two to five weeks to so actually see an effect in this. That's another human cost of waiting. The sooner you implement them, the sooner you see an effect. So my knowledge that have been an actual measure of social distancing. I'm sure there are better measures we can think of, but this is the first time that we can actually quantify it. And as a scientist, I think quantification is the, is the key here. And this, you know, anyone else that is interested in analysis, of both for the health science or for the uh, humanities or for social sciences, feel free to contact us. We'll give you all the data you need. So basically, this is all I wanted to say. Looking ahead, uh, we already have results for the United States. Here we're going to study multiple waves there too. Um, remember, I showed you that Italy does not really go to a constant in, on the plateau, but there's a little linear rise. But we, what we are studying now is the mathematics of that which hopefully we can finish quickly. We would have finished if we didn't, I did not have to prepare the talk, but it's called uh, complex pandemics, and it has to do the way you actually deal uh, these mathematics. Now you can also study the line dynamics, so you can also look at the micro scale, really one individual at a time affected the others. So these are micro uh, models. If you have... Uh, information on how impactful the vaccine can be, we can input into the data. We can actually model the uh, second wave, the multiple waves, according to the fraction of uh, success the vaccine is going to have and for how long, which will be useful to an analyze for future impact. Uh, I can imagine uh, uh, quite a few applications to the health science and to the maths. If you have artificial intelligence and machine learning, you can do this even more effectively, but I would say this is already pretty effective. And uh, hopefully we can also generalize now this approach to other realms of human and social interactions. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Right, 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 right. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Um, so this comes from actually uh, fitting to the data with the two gammas, uh, and we have this. Uh, but it was very important for us to have Google and Apple data uh, in this here to define the pre-measures. So only when we had the Google and Apple, we can actually filter out the very beginning because now we know the people we're seeing at home. So that cross-related. Thanks for asking this question, it's very important. So without Google and Apple, we couldn't actually tell very much the, how, you know, how to differentiate when they were going and not going to work. So that was extremely crucial for us to take away the noise, the beginning noise. Make sense? Thank you. Sure. So, what should we conclude from your talk? Is it then that 
that a pandemic follows in systemic logic. Yeah. That so we can control it, predict it, steer it. It has a playbook. But then I, mean, I think about the pandemic mm. and I'm more in the cultural studies mm. frame. Yeah. I think it has. It's hard for me to see the rational rules. Yeah. I yeah. think it follows more the logic of a swarm. It is yeah. kind of very unpredictable. It's yeah. highly dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. It's emergent. And it, there are so many factors yeah. Yeah. we don't know about the pandemic. Yeah. Some people are very vulnerable about yeah. it. Yeah. Some people are not. Yeah. Uh, there are uh, also cultural aspects about it, like how, yes. how, how where yeah. the pandemic takes its toll. Absolutely. Political aspects. I mean, what do you Right, so that, 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 that's the beauty of it, right? When you actually look at the overall world data in the different countries, you do see patterns which are more universal than you thought. And that's the beauty of it. The beauty of physics is to simplify the problems to the extent that actually you can be predicted, right? You take the plane, right, every day, or you used to. You, you drive a car. With a physics, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't trust to step your foot on a plane because... Uh, Oh, but again, the question is, I, I account for things I know. The things I don't know, I can actually model them later. So the logic is that, can we identify time scales? Now, there is also an intrinsic uh, duration of the virus itself, which is already a time scale. For example, one of the things I learned, which I didn't know, how come that Ebola and the previous SARS did not go to the entire world? Because they were very aggressive. They killed people so fast, they couldn't spread. That means the timing for the virus was insanely fast. They were very effective, they killed, but then they, they killed themselves too in the process. So unfortunately, um, in a way, the um, COVID has found a sweet spot for which it infects, but it doesn't kill so much, so they can keep infected. This time, two weeks and incubation time, so forth, so on, that rate, is actually things you can uh, model, you can generalize, you can tune, you can actually understand better. That's what we're aiming for. But on the top of that, there's a lot of our cultural stuff. It will change forever, at least in our generations, how we touch each other, how we behave. This is something that the model doesn't control, clearly. But it can offer you a way to actually, if you're a psychologist, you maybe want to get prepared to how the next waves will turn out. So that's where it gives you a handle. For example, if, if there are um, subpopulations, we are in contact with other groups in the world, where people die very effectively, we can also take that into consideration. So we can now make it more evolved. But from my point of view, it answered the question we had at the beginning. When can we not travel again? <laughs> That I want to have an idea. Uh, makes sense. So I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Sure, I can repeat the question. So, uh, so the question was that: uh, How do you, how do you account for many variabilities, right? The cultural, can po political, and so on. And the answer is that you can do all of them, but you can certainly within a certain system with certain given social distancing measures, we can give you a decent playbook for that. So there was uh, two questions. Um, one with the Google and Apple data. Uh, can you tell when, like, if there's like a lag or delay between when, uh, like, the social distancing restrictions are lifted and then when people change their behaviors? Because it persists for a while. Yes. Because there's people that are already normalized mm -hmm. to kind of like living right. at home and doing all these things, and then you know people are cautious. Uh, so you were just working with the data, what did you see on average? The answer is exactly here. I mean, in average is, uh, so the question is, how do you see change of trends yeah. from the Google and Apple days? Right, right. It, it, first of all, these are trends. Tells you in over the, from February up to June. Okay, so that's the window that we chose to study this data. Tells you, for example, the trends, right? which one was staying at home more and did not go to work. Uh, this is a trend you can say. Now, the other question that you ask is in terms of uh, when do they change their behavior and whether this is due to cultural, 
behavior or it's due to the state or it's due to, you know, people getting scared because people did get scared. But if you see uh, so many uh, trucks loaded with uh, dead body in Italy, that affects the entire world. So that's where, for example, we can use here to actually uh, find two different infection rates. There can be many more, but this is actually the overall uh, simplest things. And determine the time it takes for uh, social distancing have an impact. And we find out here that it's about two to six weeks in average. Hmm? Because what I'm thinking about yeah. is anecdotally, it's like a lot of restrictions, and a few weeks later, people start coming yeah. out. Like that. Right. Like that, so yes. Like it's kind of right. Like the effect of like the effect of right. Right, right. So this was on the first wave. So only taking into, took into account the first wave and assuming that they did not, and in fact, that was the case, many countries did not change the restriction over a couple of months. And that's what we're doing. Now you can do what happened when you uh, leave the restrictions, and then you go to the second wave. And that's what we actually have done. So now you can actually restart that. What was the question? Um, thank you very much. A very interesting talk. Um, have you ever tried to compare, let's say, for instance, Denmark and Germany? Because there were different kind of rules. Uh, for instance, I think in Denmark it's only one meter distance, in Germany it's one and a half meter. In Germany you have to wear a mask. Whenever you're around yes, in public, yes. while in Denmark, I think only public transport. Yeah. So have you had any look at that? Yeah, so, so we've done all the countries, right? So we have done that. So you can put them uh, nor normalized per million and then tell uh, the difference, right? So let's see if I, I, I showed you in, in very fast this. This is actually the result of the feats. These are not just genetic curves. So this was for the first wave. <laughs> so that you have uh, Germany, the EU. Huh? And this is uh, the orange one. The German did pretty well, normalized per million, compared, for example, to uh, Spain. So, I mean, in terms of Germany to Denmark. Denmark is here. Really different rules. I mean, yeah. Like right. But, but it did not change very much the duration of the, uh, of the, of the overall. Uh, in this first wave, it did not change very much the duration uh, of, the, of, the, of the epidemic. So, the infection, infection rate. Infection rate. Well, rough, well, they did a little bit, but not by much. No, I will go there because in this data, do not take into account, for example, the orology means how Denmark is geographically, how flat it is, because that, then I will say something which goes beyond my knowledge. You have to be very careful because in Italy there are mountains. People live in different villages. They're very close to each other. They're very old population. Yes, right, absolutely. But that is not, but I'm saying I'm not answering the question to say you don't need masks. That's because it's not the correct answer. The answer is that you have to study more specifically the, uh, the details of your population to do that and optimize that. I mean, Denmark, again, there are many already social rules, even before social distancing, which not, uh, they're not, uh, they don't apply to the southern countries. Like, you, you know. You don't kiss on the cheeks here when you meet. And that's where, you know, makes a difference. So if you have a mask, most likely in Italy you have a less desire to kiss somebody on the cheek. But that's something I don't want to control. I mean, at least beyond my, uh, what the study does that. What the study does that does here is that you have to appreciate is that, you know, within 10 weeks, the first wave was over in most of the countries. And that is quite universal, which is highly non-trivial. And that is important part. Of course, the variation, how many you know, were infected, take Spain, it's much more infected than anything else here. And the entire duration was about 10 weeks. So these are general trends you can study, which means probably social distancing was reasonable, but the impact of that was also in the overall number of people infected. I hope this helps. And actually, we're using that now for the second wave. And it's because of this and, and gamma is higher. I mean, the infection is higher for Spain. The Spain started first again. 
So the playbook for the second wave is like the race, is that the, the stronger is your infection rate per country, the sooner you're gonna get it. And indeed that works well again. So you can be predictive now. It's kind of, kind of exciting. I mean. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, uh, we have to, uh, to end the lecture now. Uh, time's up, but uh, give him a, a great time. Uh, um, Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Uh, <laughs> Just before you uh, you leave, I want to. Uh, encourage you to, uh, to, to take your time, ask further questions, debate, discuss. We have uh, different variations of fruit, so vegetables and drinks. And I uh, want to, uh, to invite you all to next week's uh, lecture by uh, Angela Chang, who's a DS Fellow, Measuring Disease Burden Globally and Locally. Uh, you can see more about the lecture on uh, our Facebook and on our website and sign up to be here present in person or uh, follow on, uh, on YouTube. We are continuing to try to be better at live stream. It's a new experience for us. So if you have any suggestions or, or thoughts, you're welcome to send them to me. Uh, you can find my contact.